Lord, we can arise and come to you because you came to us. You came to us on earth from heaven to love us, to teach us, to die in our place, to rise again. And you will come again to make our ultimate rising, to be with you for eternity. So we thank you for this season in which we acknowledge that maybe more than ever. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. I'm wondering if you have been asked this question this week. And if you have not, you probably are going to be asked this question in the week ahead. Are you ready for the holidays? <laughs> have you heard that yet? If not, somebody's going to ask you, get ready. It's here. It's here. It comes every year. Are you ready? Are you ready for the holidays? Um, when, and when you think about the holidays, you know, that's kind of our, our current expression. And the English word, you know, uh, originally it was holy days, right? And we just replaced the Y with an I. But are you ready for the holy days? What does it mean to make a day holy? Holy just means to set aside. It means that something is different and unique and hopefully sacred, so you set it aside. So I hope um, that over the next six weeks, because it's Thanksgiving this week, and then it's four weeks of Christmas, and then it's a week of New Year, especially in Pasadena with the Rose Parade and all that, it's kind of a, a New Year's week-long celebration. And then six weeks from today, we say goodbye to 2023 and hello to 2024. So are you ready for the holidays? Here's another thing that's going to happen in the next six weeks. And it's absolutely unique. Um, and I would ask you, if, if you can think of, a, of, a, of an exception to this, let me know because I've, I've been thinking about this all week long. I think Christianity is the only religion or faith uh, um, commitment that has, um, that has a holiday that goes all over the world. That even if, uh, and certainly Christians celebrate Christmas, but even people that are not Christians, they, they may not celebrate, they might not even like it, but they have to deal with it. And Christian, Christmas is, it's global. It's not just Pasadena, California, United States. It's all over the world. Wherever you go in the world, there is some acknowledgement that it's Christmas. And it's different. It's different. Uh, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. And so then that therefore leads you to this final uh, conclusion, but also a segue into what we want to study this morning, that in the next six weeks, whether people want to or not, they're going to think about Jesus. <laughs> they are. And, and they're, gonna, um, they're almost going to be forced to because it's just going to be everywhere. It's going to be on Christmas cards. It's going to be on window decorations. It's going to be on television. It's going to be in movies. It's, it's every, and it's global. It is global. Southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, east, west, north, south. It's everywhere, right? So then the question becomes, and this is kind of what leads us into our study uh, this morning, is um, if people are going to think about Jesus, are they going to think in terms of whether they should follow him or not? And for some people, the answer will be no. They say, uh, you know, I'm more convinced than ever. I do not want to follow Jesus Christ. Other people will say, yeah, I think I'm even going to deepen the commitment that I already have. And then some people are going to kind of be in between. It always goes that way, doesn't it? It's always that direction. Um, so we're so uh, aware of this here at Trinity Baptist. And, and just to, to give you a little bit of a preview, in your bulletin this morning, you have a little half sheet. Thanks to, to Jeff uh, Ledoux, even with a, a messed up hand, he didn't miss a day of work and uh, uh, appreciate. And frankly, you're not doing, you don't have the Napoleon position this week, right? So we, we can't call you Jeff Bonaparte anymore. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
this is what we're, we're going to take a break. This, uh, we've been going through this series in the Gospel of John. And, and we're going to stop that for five, because there's five Sundays in December. So we're going to call this series in December Christmas People, okay? And we're just going to look at, at five different um, uh, individuals as well as groups of people that had this encounter with uh, the Christmas story. So we're going to look um, at the ancestors, the young father, the young mother, the unexpected, and then the old and faithful. So that'll be kind of the December's schedule. But today, and then next week as well, we're going to finish, if you have your Bibles, in John chapter 12. And the other reason that this, this is a nice flow is that in the Gospel of John, chapter 12 really is, is, is a perfect place to just stop, to stop and to pause and to think. Because the end of chapter 12 that we'll look at next week, actually, brings to an end the public ministry of Jesus Christ. And then you still have eight more, nine more chapters, 13 to 21, and we'll, we'll pick that up again in January, and that'll take us up to the Easter uh, time in April. But that, ha that then brings Christ to focus more on his 12 disciples, and then his family, and then uh, those at the crucifixion, the resurrection. But in terms of big crowds, big uh, public addresses, it's over now. It's over. And as we said last week, this section in, in chapter 12 that begins with verse 20 and then it goes down to verse 50, that's really um, his last public speech to a big crowd. And so we've divided this into three uh, thirds. And uh, last week, we, we looked at think, it, thinking about following Jesus, part one. Today, we're going to look at part two in, in verses 27 to 36 of John chapter 12. So um, if you have your Bibles, we'll, we'll just take a look at um, three things. Because really, and this is, this is kind of appropriate, and maybe as you gather with family and friends uh, over the next six weeks, different events, um, there may be people in your family, uh, in, in your friendship circle, that are just pondering this. You know, they're, they're thinking about Jesus. Maybe they've been forced to. Maybe you represent uh, uh, Christ to them, and, and they ponder, you know, should I follow what you follow? Um, and, and like any big decision in life, and it's a big decision to become a follower of Jesus. It's not something you should take lightly. Even Jesus himself, when he approached people, he never, he never um, uh, just said, hey, just ignore your brain and ignore your thoughts and ignore your feelings. No, he, he encouraged people to think deeply and broadly and to count the cost. Before you decide to follow me, you better understand what that involves, right? So it's not a light decision. So there are some things to consider, like any big decision in life. What do you consider, if you're thinking about it, what should you consider? So we're going to look at, um, first of all, consider what Jesus himself had to face. Let me just read uh, verses 27, 28. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. My soul is troubled, says Jesus. So it's, it's, he's almost speaking to himself. Why is uh, his soul troubled? It's interesting that this is, is um, uh, uh, it's one of three times in, in, in the Bible where this word is, is used of Jesus. Actually, it's, it's one of, it's the fourth of four times, actually. But it's first seen uh, back in chapter 11. Do you remember when we were talking about how, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and uh, Lazarus' sister Mary comes out and she's weeping and all those people with her was weeping and Jesus sees Mary weeping. And, and what's the description? He was troubled in his soul. Same word. 
You now see it here. He's troubled in his soul before he enters the last six days of his life on earth. You'll see it again, uh, in, and we'll look at this in January, in chapter 13, in, in the, the, what we call the Last Supper. Um, he's gathered the 12 around the night before his crucifixion. And, he, and, what, and what troubles him? He declares that one of the 12, we now know it's Judas Iscariot. They didn't know it at the time, but Jesus knew it. And he said, he, he said that one of you will betray me. And it's the same word. He was troubled by that. The last place you see it um, is actually later that night. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he's crucified. And he goes away, and, and it says three times he went away and prayed, you know, Father, if, 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 it, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. And, and it's the same word. He was troubled in his soul. So you see four times that word is used. Now, why is that significant? Because it, you know, we just say, well, in English language, troubled, maybe that to you just means that, um, you know, you're, the Dodgers lost the World Series and you're troubled by that, you know? Come on. Um, so we get troubled by some pretty trivial things in life, don't we? But this word, to be troubled in, in these four capacities, that Jesus was. You cannot, in, in the Greek language that we translate into English, there is no word, there is no word that, that even comes close in English. It is a, it is a word that uh, describes um, uh, an intensity of physical distress, emotional upheaval, it is, it, is pro, it is as deep as any word can go to describe human emotion. That's what he's feeling. And so you look at this and you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. If Jesus was God, then he knows what's coming, so why is he troubled? Because he's God. Uh, go back to chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus was God, but he was also fully human, right? So he's fully human, he's fully God. Trying to understand that is the great mystery of the human mind, but here you see his humanity come to the service. And so he's troubled, he's troubled in his soul. The full He had the full range of emotions. And Here's, here's maybe the source of that. He's thinking about the death that he's heading toward on the cross. If, if, if Jesus' death on the cross was only a physical death, probably you would not see that he was troubled. Because you know something, and you, you may know people. You may even have people in your own family. I, I've watched people die that were absolutely stoic about it. You know, history is, is full of examples of people that went not only to their death, maybe from illness, but even to their execution and just were like this, stoic, you know. And, and do you think that uh, if a human being can face death uh, stoically, that Jesus couldn't have done that? Of course he could have. Of course he could have. But his death is unique. Because as he looked ahead to his death, first of all, he's a sinless person. And yet his death is not just physical, but hopefully you all know this because you've read the rest of the story. His death involved all the sin of the human race from Adam and Eve until 2023 and beyond. And that death, you, you, there is no human being that has ever had to face that, and never will. You cannot be stoic in the face of that kind of a death. And that's why he's troubled, because he knows, he knows that all of the wrath of God on, on human sin is coming on him. 
And yet, we, because we can't save ourselves, right? At this point in his kind of his speech, um, you know, if you don't know the rest of the story, you have to realize, I have to realize that I'm dependent, my future is dependent on his answer, right? Uh, because he expresses this to God the Father, save me from this hour. It's, you know, it's kind of a question, but it's also a statement. And then here's the answer. And thank, <laughs> sometimes we use this phrase flippantly, th thank the Lord or thank God. But listen, friends, if your soul is, um, the future of your soul is dependent on his answer. And thanks be to God for the answer he gave. But, but, in the midst of my trouble, it was for this purpose I have come to this hour, right? And we said that last week, his hour has come. And so his purpose overrides his emotion and his troubled soul. And because that answer comes, you and I have a future. You and I have a future. And then this voice comes. And um, you, you hear the voice of God other places in the Bible. You hear it um, when Jesus, it is baptism. You heard it at the transfiguration. It's not a voice that humans, you know, they, they know something's going on, but a voice from heaven, I have glorified it. Je Jesus says, glorify your name. And then the Father says, I have glorified it. How, did, how That's past tense. How had he already glorified it? Not only through the ministry of Jesus, but supremely through the miracles that he's already done. And there were seven miracles in the Gospel of John that are recorded. And then I will glorify it again in the future. So there's a past glorification just in the ministry of Jesus, and then the future glorification beyond the cross. Death, resurrection, ultimately second coming. And so it's, it's past and it's also future. So a little bit of what Jesus had to face. How, secondly, how about uh, what his generation had to face? Uh, because as we said last week, he comes into a first century world that um, it's kind of made up its mind about what, what life is throwing at them. Um, on one hand, they have a glorious history. They, they know about their exodus from Egypt uh, their deliverance from slavery as God brought them away from Egypt. They know about the prophets. They know about the law. They, um, in, 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 in the generation that Jesus grew up in, as we said last week, uh, what, what they really thought about, because it was so close to them, it was only 150 years prior, uh, the generation Jesus grew up in uh, were just absolutely focused on the hero, the Jewish heroes that we, we now call the Maccabees, the, the, the family of the, the Maccabee family, the father and all of his sons that, that uh, uh, drove out the, the oppressing um, uh, uh, armies and restored and cleansed the temple again. And as we said last week, uh, the Maccabees were so important to Jesus' generation that uh, five out of Jesus' 12 disciples were named, had Maccabee names. They were named for the sons of the Maccabees. Two of, uh, we, we know that Jesus had at least four brothers. Their names are recorded and, and at least two sisters. He was at least one of seven children. Um, that's, we see that in the other gospel. And, and two of Jesus' four brothers, Simon and, and Judah, were named for Maccabees. So Jesus' own family, Joseph and Mary, were so aware of the heroes of recent Jewish history that they named two of their sons after the Maccabees. And so the, this world that Jesus comes into, and this all plays into what we talked about when his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. It, the, what this generation had to face in Christ, they hear this voice from heaven. They don't know if it's thunder or angels. They just, they just know something significant is going on. Um, but they have to face the fact that what they have become comfortable with, even though they're under, under the thumb of the Romans, the Romans oppress them, heavy taxation, military, political control, they'd grown used to it. And they didn't like it, 
but they had adjusted, they had adapted, and so they at least knew it was a predictable life when they got up in the morning. They didn't like it, but it was predictable. So, you know, there's some comfort and predictability. All of a sudden, this gets shaken up. There's an intervention, and it begins with this voice from heaven, and they, what's going on here? They don't, something's happening. And then look at verse 31. Um, I'll just read the rest of this. The crowd that stood there heard it, thought it had thundered. Others said, no, an angel has spoken to him. Then Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. He knew, he knew what the voice was. He, he understood the Father's voice. This is for your sake. Verse 31. Why? Now. Now. Just, just like Jesus' hour had come, now the hour has come for his generation. Now, what has come? Judgment. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Interesting, the word judgment. English, we say judgment. You, you know what that, there, uh, there's another English word. I don't know why uh, we don't use it because it, has, it seems to have more power to it. You know what that word is? Crisis. If you look at a Greek New Testament, the only difference is crisis is spelled with a K. The first letter is a K instead of a C in Greek, but we just take the word. And so, you, so just to maybe get a little bit more the power of what he's saying, now is the crisis of this world. When you hear the word crisis, that, does it wake you up? <laughs> Most people don't sleep through a crisis, right? This is a crisis, Jesus says. Now is the, the judgment. Now is the crisis of this world. Why is it a crisis? Because the ruler of this world, and we know from other scripture, he's talking directly about Satan, will be cast out. It's finally happening. The hour has come. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So what, what he's saying here, the crisis, and it actually began back in Genesis, chapter 3, verse 14, where, where, where God pronounces uh, the sentence upon Satan, right? But it's, but it's just taken thousands of years and generations. Now it's coming. Now, does that mean that Satan is, is uh, permanently eliminated? No, but the cross will um, cast out Satan as the ruler of this world, and then the second coming will, will, will finish the job, right? Um, but in the meantime, uh, Satan's work is restricted, and, and we'll see that a couple of months from now in John chapter 16, where the Holy Spirit restrains the work of Satan. Uh, but for right now, the judgment has come, and it's temporary, and it's also eternal. So there's a temporary judgment. Uh, Satan is restricted. There will be an eternal judgment where the, the job becomes finished. And then notice in, in 32, 33, uh, just so nobody has any doubt, once again, when I'm lifted up, when I'm lifted up, and that's just, uh, again, a, a different way of saying what lifted up on the cross. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. It just means that everybody that will be saved will be because of what's on the cross. And he said this to show the kind of, he didn't want any um, uh, doubt in the mind. This is the kind of death he was going to die. Why would verse 33 be so important to Jesus' generation? <clears throat> they expected the Messiah to come, but they did not expect the Messiah to be crucified. In Jewish thinking, it, it's, and frankly, that's true today, too. Most Jews that I know, talk to, the, the biggest hang-up they have with Christianity is a crucified Messiah. That's just not in Jew, J the Jewish mind. That's, that's a curse. To hang on a tree is a curse. So how could the Messiah be crucified? That just is not in their mind, right? So, so they have to face that. That this, that this is the Messiah, and he will be crucified. No doubt about it. Uh, so they have to rethink who they're dealing with here. Um, and, and, if, and if they follow, if they decide to become a follow Jesus, what do they have to give up? 
they they have to give up um, and and you know maybe in in words that uh, some of your young relatives are going to understand this Christmas when they look for a present under the tree. Um, this applies in every generation. It's not just an issue for 2023 America. You, you know what? You know what Jesus' generation had to give up. Action heroes. Right? You got any children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews that you ask, what, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I want an action hero. Every generation wants an action hero. Who were the action heroes for Jesus' generation? The Maccabees. That's why two of his brothers were named Simeon and Judah. That's why five of his 12 disciples were named after the Maccabees. The Maccabees were the action heroes of the first century. They got to give that up. They have to recognize that the Maccabees did a good job, and, and, and it doesn't denigrate action. He, you know, every do, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here, okay? Uh, we ought to celebrate men and women in history that have stood up against injustice and unrighteousness and have, con and have spoke the truth to power. So that's a good, you know, do not minimize that. The problem is, for his generation, that they had translated that to their expectation that the Messiah would just be another Maccabee. It'd be political, military, get rid of the Romans. They had to give that up. They had to give that up. And what goes along with that? They had to give up a lot of stuff they'd learned from the rabbis. They, had, they, they would have to give up their weekly annual um, religious uh, activity that, that is no longer necessary. And were they willing to give that up? Well, some of them were, um, but a lot of them weren't because, as we said um, last week, um, he's saying this on Sunday, four days later, 96 hours later, the same people that said, Hosanna, welcome to the one who comes in the name of the Lord, were screaming, crucify him, right? So even though people that are oppressed, uh, upset with the political situation, uh, economically, da-da-da-da-da, the Messiah comes and they say, no, 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 no. We, we, we crucify this guy. We'll just stay underneath the thumb because you don't live up to our expectation of what an action hero is. So that's what, a little bit of what his generation had to face. So thirdly, what do we have to face? Um, not much different, not much different. Uh, 35 and 36, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And so he's saying to them, look, I... I'm, what he's saying to his generation is what he says to us, really. He's saying, I, I'm with you right now. I will not always be with you. Um, you know, within just a matter of 24 hours, he's, or, or six days, he's going to be crucified, dead, resurrected. And then he stays on earth 40 days and he goes back to heaven. So he's not going to be with them. He'll send his Holy Spirit to be with us. Um, but maybe more practically for you and I, um, what we have to face, and we've, we've said this before, and it's just, it's a good reminder. You know, how do you define your life? Uh, of all the ways you describe your life, one of the simplest and yet one of the most profound is life is taking your turn. Taking your turn. You have one turn at being alive. You were born, you live, and then you're going to die. Who knows when, but it's going to happen, right? So the issue is, what are you doing with your turn? And as long as you're alive, even though Jesus isn't physically with us through his word, through the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says the same thing to us as that he said to his generation. He's saying, while you have the light, walk in the light. Um, 
in verse 36, it's, it's actually, it even gets into the grammar a little bit. Because he says here, while you have the light, uh, believe in the light. That's what you, grammatically, that's a, con, um, that's a continuous movement. In other words, keep believing. You're, you're, you're getting light. You're get, you're, hopefully when you come to Trinity Baptist, you're getting a little bit of light. Believe in the light. Why? So that you may become sons, and that it would be sons, it's generic, it's sons and daughters of light. That, that's not uh, continue. that's a one time, that's what, the, it's called the aorist tense of the verb. So uh, you go from con continuous light, the imperfect in the Greek grammar, to an aorist in the Greek grammar, which means continue in the light to the point where at a point of time, you become a son or daughter of the light. That's conversion, right? So listen, you know, consider these things. Don't make the decision lightly. It may take some people longer than others. Keep exposing yourself to Jesus' teaching. Expose yourself to the light. So before you die and the, load, and the light is no longer available, you might become at a point of time a son and daughter of the light. That's what he's saying to our generation. Now, I want to... Um, I wanted to say a couple things here, then we're going we're gonna, to uh, start to close this up. Um, I, I am, of all the things I'm grateful for this week, Thanksgiving, and, and thanks for saying happy birthday. I was born on Thanksgiving morning, right? So it, Thanksgiving, every six years, uh, uh, Thanksgiving is my birthday this way. This year it's Friday. But um, uh, and as I told you last year, uh, I went into Glendale Adventist Hospital and on my birthday one morning, and the guy that's sitting, what Mamie does, this guy sitting behind the, the welcome desk, and I went, it's my birthday! I was born in this hospital today! Guy'd been up all night. He looks at me, he goes, <laughs> that's... That's when I knew that not everybody's excited about me being born, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, I don't think that guy works there anymore. <laughs> I was going to go over this Friday. But, uh, but of all the things I'm grateful for this week, I'm really grateful for Trinity Baptist Church. And you've been so kind. And, and you're, you're kinder than, than I deserve. But, I, but I'm grateful for you. But here's... I was thinking about this all week long. If I, if I only had one piece of advice to give to Trinity Baptist, to you as the, as the people of Trinity Baptist, this would be it. This would be it. You, uh, and it's not just Trinity. It, 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 it applies to anybody that stands behind a pulpit and, and preaches the Bible, okay? And it doesn't matter if you listen to them on the radio, television, online, read their books. Um, there's a lot of ways to evaluate sermons, and, and, and you should have maybe a, a fairly long list. Um, but here's the number one thing that you must always never, never, ever let go of. You, and, and including myself, but just because this, at this point in time, this happens to be something I, I'm doing here at Trinity, um, my best piece of advice to you is never listen to someone preach from this pulpit who is not comprehensively aware of who's behind them and who's above them. Never listen to someone preach who is not comprehensively aware of who's behind them and who's above them. Now, we said this last week, and I just want to anchor this down. Architecturally, this church has already declared that. The issue is going to be is if, if your preachers in the future um, and your leadership are willing to grapple with this. So let me just step to the side and point. Every time somebody stands behind this pulpit, who's behind and above them?
Uh, Easter's not till March 31st, but frankly, the only reason we celebrate Christmas is because of that. Right? Jesus came to die, not stay a baby, because we were in bad shape. Uh, never listen to a preacher who is not comprehensively aware of who's behind them and above them, primarily because you should never listen to a preacher who is not comprehensively aware of the devastation of their own soul apart from what Jesus did on the cross. And if you're listening to someone on a regular basis and you're not picking that up, then go find another preacher because they're going to take you over a cliff. Most churches that get in trouble, that split, most pastors, and we've all, we've all known this, most pastors that fall, that are out of the ministry for, you know, all the, the usual suspects, money, sex, and power. Those are usually the big three. One of the big three or all three. Almost invariably, you know, um, it's not the only reason, but you know one of the primary reasons that preachers and pastors fall away is because people in their congregation stop right here. They don't look behind and above. And they start to worship their preacher instead of who's behind and above their preacher. So if you want to protect the future of Trinity Baptist Church, make sure that you, you know, and hopefully whoever stands behind here is, is, is aware of who's behind and above. But never, never turn your eyes to this. Turn it to that. That's the only reason this church exists. And in the, in the moment this church stops seeing that, close the doors and go to the beach because there's no reason for you to be here. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, John, if you'd put that last slide with the four, th there are four ways to think about this. And this is just, um, we're missing number one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, when you, and this is true Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't matter what part of the Bible you're, you're talking about. This is a framework for thinking. So if you're, um, if you're thinking about following Jesus, I hope you are, and maybe you've already made that decision, but, and I really respect your process. I mean, not everybody <laughs> jumps right in. For some people, it takes a long time. But as you consider whether you should become a follower of Jesus. Here's the fundamental framework. This is the gospel. This is what the Bible's all about. If you can just remember these four things. The way things ought to be, the way things are, the way things could be, and the way things will be. Kind of simple, right? The way things ought to be. That was creation. This was God's original plan. This is how things ought to be. But then there was a fault. The way things are, it was a fall. Started with Adam and Eve, it's been happening ever since. How about the way things could be? That's redemption, that's, the God. that's what Jesus is offering. It's a choice, you have to make a decision whether you're gonna follow that. The thing, way things will be, consummation. Consummation just means that's the end. That's the wrap up. And ultimately, that's what's gonna happen. That's the second coming, okay? So we're over the, uh, the Christmas uh, Sunday, over the next six weeks, we'll come back to this. And I think Jeff, maybe we'll just print that, put that in a little. I think that's, help is that helpful to you? I, I found this really through the years. Um, there's variations on this, but um, that's, uh, that's really, you know, maybe even over the holidays, if you wanna sit down with family or friends, maybe if, if they're curious, maybe just sit down and show them this. Think, hey, what do you think about this? You know, maybe this is something to consider. Last thing, because I know that um, some of you are going to be with family and friends starting this week, maybe Thursday, <laughs> and uh, certainly Christmas or New Year's. And um, you're already anticipating who's going to be there. I know I'm, I'm going to a gathering. Uh, all, I, my fam, all of our plans changed last minute, so... 
I'm going to go um, uh, uh, be with family this Thursday, but I just found out this week that there's going to be a bunch of people there that I don't, I've never met. They're kind of extended family. So it's good. Looking forward to it. Um, so um, y you may or may not uh, uh, approve of members of your family in terms of um, what they look like, how they talk, and how they act. And there's nothing like the holidays to bring all that to the surface, right? Uh, family dynamics, you can't beat them. So uh, our, as our wrap up, I, I asked John and Julianne to, um, I, if you don't know her, I want to introduce you to a young one. She's, well, she's 41 years old now, so you, she's young to me. But um, anyway, do, does anyone know who this is? Who is that? That is Kat Von D. Do you, have you ever heard of, you don't know who Kat Von D is? Anybody heard that name? Her actual name is uh, Catherine Von Drakenberg. Uh, so she goes, it's hard to remember. So this is Kat Von D. If you don't know Kat Von D, uh, she's now 41, uh, married, has a, a young son. But um, her parents are from Argentina. They immigrated to Mexico. She was born in a very small town in central Mexico. Uh, I, I don't know what year, but then her family moved to the United States. And um, during her teenage years, she got into, as you can tell by her arms, she became kind of the premier tattoo artist. In fact, she had her own television show. It was called uh, LA Inc. Was that some of you? Yeah, it was kind of a national kind of big, made a lot of money. Uh, she lived three houses down from the mayor of Los Angeles over in, <laughs> so, you know, she's, she's got some, some uh, uh, success there business-wise. And uh, tattoos were her thing. Along with the tattoo business was, uh, she got pretty heavy into occult, uh, what she would call witchcraft. And um, somewhere in her late 30s, uh, she says, uh, if, if you go online, she um, uh, was with her young son, and her husband came down from the second story and just looked her in the face and said, Kat, we, it's, we're all wrong. We've been, we, we're going the wrong direction. We're, we're, we're going the wrong direction. He said, look at our friends. All of our friends that think like we do, they're messed up. We have a couple of friends that are followers of Jesus, and they, they got something going for them. I think we ought to go explore what, what they're thinking. Well, the upshot is, to make a short story long here, um, <laughs> she uh, and her husband um, start studying the Bible, start talking to their friends, start to... Put up the next picture, John, if you would. This is the upshot. Who's that? Kat Von D. She's getting baptized. She's in a Bible-believing church. She's in a church. She, she would fit into Trinity Baptist. Um, she's now, I don't know, uh, I think they've moved to Indiana now, actually. For I'm not sure what the family connection is. But here's, here's the final thing I want to say, and I, and I want to say this because I know what you're facing. I know, who, I know, I know what I'm going to be facing on Thursday, and I, I got a feeling I know what some of you are facing. Uh, I know there are going to be some people that in my uh, gathering over the holidays, and, and, and here's the big word right now. If you haven't heard this, I'm sure, oh, I'm sure you have, because it's, it's like the new... Um, uh, it's like the new Amer American word for people that are uh, used to be called Christians. We're now spiritual, spirituality, right? So um, I've got some people I already know. I, this one guy, he always shows up at the holidays. Oh, you're really into spirituality. And I go, well, it's a little more than that. But uh, uh, here's what... One of the reasons that Kat Von D and her husband and her child now are followers of Jesus, and I hope this 
uh, when you think, and I know some of you are really fighting this. Some of you have children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, young people in your family. And you look at them, you, you look at the way they look, how they think, how they talk. And, and, and then some of you I know have said, man, they were, they were raised in the church. They know, and they just, they've walked away from Christian faith. You know, they broke my heart. Are my, are my children and my grandchildren, my, my family, are they ever going to come back to Jesus? Here's the good news. Kat D. Van, D. Van D. had a long road. But you know what helped? You know why her parents moved from Argentina to Mexico? They were missionaries. Her father was a medical missionary. She grew up as a missionary kid. She was an MK, as they say in the business, right? She grew up every day hearing the gospel from her mom and dad and her family. And she walks away for 30-some years and now comes back to it. So all that to say, if you're discouraged about your children and your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews and your family, keep praying, don't give up, and, and no guarantees, but look what happened to her. If it happened to her, why can't it happen to your loved one, right? Let's sing, we got this great song. This is an old, this is an old Texas song. When I, when I lived in Texas and got squared away in the Baptist church. This was a song we always sang at the end of a service, and it's such a great uh, testimony of faith and, and uh, thanksgiving. Only trust him. This is an old timer. So let's sing that, and then we'll be finished. So by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. He will surely give you rest, trusting in His word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Jesus shed His precious blood. of salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth, showing us the way to heaven. Thank you in your holy name. Amen. Before you go,